set your seat in its upright position, and uh, buckle up because you're about to experience the funniest Bible study in the history of the universe. Greg Perry, the most interesting author in the world, unleashes rip splitting insight from the most important book ever written. While Perry is the masculine theologian, he's also joyful, gleeful, playful, grateful, whimsical, and always biblical. Here you get the Super Bowl of Bible study, the Stradivarius of podcasts, and the Armageddon of truth. And while you're laughing, <laughs> he may just scare you off the path to hell. And here's the man you are waiting for. Well, it's his podcast after all. Greg Perry. Yeah, the train ride of truth tracking toward you. I am your ever-loving host, Greg Perry, with Dexter. He's my sound guy. We're back reminding you that every Gregcast podcast broadcast, the funniest Bible study in the history of the universe, is a 100% completely judgment-free zone. We ask that you honor our request for a judgment-free zone here by never charging money to judge others. And we promise you that we will never charge you or anyone else any money when we start judging and rebuking you. Oh, we're wrapping up last week's show. The problem of how to pray for our leaders, such as an ungodly president. We learned how to pray for good leaders, and we learned how to pray for bad leaders. We learned how to pray for saved Christian leaders, and how to pray for unsaved Christian leaders, and we saw it's the very same prayer. Praying this way, the way that God commands us to do, produces such a great outcome. It, it's a good government and a nation, a nation that's joyful and thankful. I strongly urge you, before you finish listening to this podcast, that you go back to podcast number three and listen to it start to finish. It sets up everything and, I believe, is the podcast, perhaps the most important podcast ever recorded to bring a righteous government back to America. Now that says a lot, and I exaggerate just when I'm being pompous and funny, <laughs> but I seriously believe we pray for our government completely 100% wrong basically every single time. And I believe we have a horrible government and runaway crime. We saw last time the airplanes at Los Angeles, they're so afraid of people stealing, stealing the planes that they put a club on the airplane steering wheels. I, I'm not actually sure that's true, but it might be. Praying this way, praying the way God commands us to do, produces a great outcome. So seriously, go back and listen to podcast number three before you hear this one. Go ahead. We'll, we'll wait here. Today we're going to continue this, but it's, it's going to really get fun. Except crime. Crime is rampant today. We started talking about it last week. It's an epidemic in America. I suggest it's our fault. It's the Christian's fault. Bad government encourages crime. And until we pray corporately for the government the way God tells us to do, why do we ever think that we'll have a good government that protects the innocent and punishes the guilty? I, I say we will not have a righteous government as long as we pray wrongly or not at all for the government. Now, today our government's far too busy spending our resources on wasteful activities that they have no business in. I believe it's because we're not praying correctly. That's my message, and I'm sticking to it. So we're going to get to the why of those details in a moment. We'll get to the punchline today. Oh, also we discussed, remember this, the history of the Jews and how they were such jerks so often and that we're just like them? <laughs> They ignored what God told them over and over and over and over, and they were always in trouble. God often punished them, and they'd repent, and then they'd sin again until finally God removed all the Jews from Israel. But the point I was trying to make about the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, oh man, the danger they faced, it was all brought home to me on a personal level about how frightening the plight of the Jews were when I was a kid. Did you ever see the Jews movie? Oh, it was so scary. I saw that Jews movie as a kid. I was probably, I don't know, five or six or seven. 
And he just kept swimming close to the boats and attacking people and eating all the swimmers and even getting close to the shore. They had to shut down the whole beach. But anyway, back to what we were talking about. Which is correct? This is a revisiting of the multiple choice test I gave you last week. You should know the answer by now if you've listened to podcast three. Which is correct, A or B? A, we're to pray for our ungodly leaders, salvation, or B, we're to pray that they keep their hands off our business. And most Christians, when asked how to pray for the president and other atheist, ungodly, wicked, evil leaders, they'll always say pray for their salvation. It's not that they think they know more than God. Well, at least I don't think they think that Much of the time, most of the time, Christians simply have no idea that God doesn't seem to want them wasting time and prayers praying that prayer. So here's the punchline. The Bible tells you and me to pray specifically for those leaders over us from the early verses that we read last week of 1 Timothy 2. And here, you can follow along now if you want to, 1 Timothy 2. God picks up right after it starts with the following phrase that we and he's talking about us believers okay he paul's not talking about everyone else all the ungodly atheist people all the leftists all the feminists all the weak males he's not talking about all of them he's talking about true christian families people paul says he prays in first timothy 2 that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence Now, let me shorten it even further. I'm going to hone the actual point Paul's making, that we, believers, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Now, let me expand it. This is from 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, and it's simple. It's less than one sentence, and God is so clear. For kings, kings, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. God is telling us how to pray. Anybody who didn't destroy every one of their brain cells, like people who get degrees in public education, they are capable of understanding that, that what God is saying here. He is saying in no uncertain terms that we are to pray that our leaders leave us alone. Read the text. If you don't understand it, if the words are too big, find another translation. It doesn't matter what translation for these set of verses. Just pick one. The leaders are to leave us alone. That's our prayer. That's the prayer inspired from God to Paul 2,000 years ago, written directly to us, you and I, to you and me, the body of Christ, that our government or our government leaders get out of the way and leave us alone. And I'll say it so I'll say it twice because it's so nice. God instructs us to pray that our leaders get out of our way and leave us alone. So, what should we expect? I mean, if we had a crystal ball, perhaps we'd know what to expect if if we prayed God's desired prayer. Oh, wait, wait. We do have something far better than a mythological crystal ball. We have brains that God gave us, and He expects us to use them. Once our leaders are out of the way, if they're not constantly always infringing on our lives and our families, What are we able to do then? We're able to lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godly ways. We can worship the way God teaches us to. We have family and church resources that are all freed up to begin doing the right things with our personal and church funds. We have more resources we need, time that we're not messing with tax forms or whatever. We have more resources we need to help turn this nation into a godly nation and witness in a big way. And think about this. If con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? I, Dexter's asking me what that has to do with anything we're saying. Actually, it does. Dexter, he's my sound guy. We do have a bad government, and it's our fault. Congress is bad. They're all bad. But instead, the way things are now, we, we don't have the resources to do our part to make this a godly nation. I mean, we have them, but all of our resources are tied up all the time. Time, energy, the government drains us. By the time national, state, and local taxes and national, state, and local regulations consume 50, 65, 70% of our family's income, 
it's difficult to have anything to give to our churches as we feel led, let, let alone have enough to make ends meet for the most important group in our lives, our families. Now, please understand, the following is not funny. If we don't have enough money to take care of our family due to the government's interference in our lives, it's still our responsibility to take care of our family. Ungodly government interference in our lives, perhaps helped by the bad prayers of most Christians who don't pray the godly prayer that the government stays out of our lives, but that's no excuse ever not to do the right thing. You see, the government, it's an insidious evil. We talked about this before. It sneaks up on us and infiltrates every aspect of our lives. It doesn't make it easy to follow God's word when the government is trying, and usually winning, battle after battle to be man's salvation instead of God. Now, let me ask you, what frustrates you in your life? I mean, think about what really frustrates you. Now, if you're a young person, your answer is not quite going to be the same as most people over, say, about 18 or older. What frustrates most adults, day in and day out, they're almost always related to government intrusion. And here's just a small sample. You're frustrated when you must get your driver's license renewed at the DMV. You're frustrated at having to figure out your taxes. You're frustrating paying the high level of taxes you're forced to pay. And if you don't, you'll be imprisoned. By the way, the government is just in levying taxes on our incomes. The government is unjust, though, in the level of taxes that it levies. Other people have made it clear that Samuel tells us 10% and higher taxation is tyrannical, so we know the Bible encourages a government taxation of under 10%. That is scriptural, and it's okay for the government to do that. You're frustrated knowing illegal immigrants get welfare, health care, public education. (laughs) Joke's on them, though. (laughs) Not much educating going on in the government schools. You're frustrated learning that prisons do nothing to stop crime. Actually, quite the opposite. I mean, when the inmates come out of a few years there at Khan College, they know more about crime methods than before they entered. You're frustrated knowing that murderers and rapists all go free. Now, keep in mind everything I'm saying. It's all government coerced and and ran everything. You're frustrated knowing that your hard-earned tax dollars are being used to murder 3,500 babies every day in abortuaries across across the country. In America, abortion mills are slaughtering, are murdering 3,500 babies a day plus or minus. You're frustrated by gun control laws that greatly put yourself and your family at risk, as well as increasing the risk to your home's safety. I mean, the president's home on Pennsylvania Avenue, that would never be required to follow the gun laws that you're required to follow, especially in many states today. You're frustrated by the welfare kings and welfare queens. I haven't talked about the welfare kings and welfare queens, and especially the ultimate welfare kings and ultimate welfare queens. I'm going to step on some toes here and probably lose about a third of my audience from this point forward, but I have to speak the truth. The ultimate welfare kings and the ultimate welfare queens are more commonly known as Christian parents of public school children. They take advantage of a system that robs everyone around them by force to pay for their own children's education. Except it's not an education, it's just 12 years of government training. Those same families would never think of sending their pets, their dogs, to a government-ran obedience school every day for 12 years. They would never do that to their own dog. The government is the primary problem in your life, especially if you're a Christian. So what would life be like Wouldn't it be easier and wouldn't you be far more productive if the government weren't hampering your every effort? Wouldn't your family enjoy less stressful lives if we lived in a nation where crime was uncommon as opposed to be expected? Now, I'm not saying praying properly for the government would reduce crime entirely. I mean, we're not going to get rid of it entirely. I mean, I learned from Archie Bunker that crime's been bad ever since Abel got stabbed in the back by his brother with a cane. 
But crime would be a blip on the radar instead of the massive part of our society if we prayed accurately for the government, and this is my suggestion, get out of God's way and start doing it God's way. Do you hear me? You are to get out of God's way by praying wrongly, and you are to start doing it God's way. Pray properly. Do you know what a Norman Rockwell family moment is? You have no idea if you've never heard me describe it because I just made it up myself. A Norman Rockwell family moment. Think about back in the way back, wow, almost 100 years ago now, way back in the 1920s, 30s, and no doubt up through the 1950s. Anyone knows that what I'm saying is true, even though they didn't necessarily live in any of these times. What happened when a family was out for a drive and a police car pulled up behind them or beside them? I'll tell you what probably happened. I assume the parents looked over and saw the cop and then said, Kids, there's our police, and perhaps nodded and smiled, and no doubt the cop nodded back. That's what I call a Norman Rockwell family moment. And let me assure you, Norman Rockwell family moments are few and far between these days. I mean, back then, perhaps the mom said, Kids, look, there's a policeman patrolling. He's patrolling our streets. He's keeping us safe from from the bad men. Well, fast forward to today. What happens? What happens today when a family's out for a drive and a police car pulls up behind them? Whoa! You immediately tense up. You check your rearview mirrors. You speed up. You slow down. You look at your speed. You check to see if your speed control is on. You check to see if your speed control is off. You check your lights. You get nervous. You look at him out of the corner of your eye, but you try not to look as though you're looking at him out of the corner of your eye or he's going to think you're doing something wrong. You kind of get shaky in your lane because you're trying to stay in your lane and not be shaky. And you wonder if your license is current, wonder if you've been speeding, wonder if you were driving too slowly, your forehead and hands start glistening with sweat over your car tag maybe not being up to date or a tail light being out or maybe your brake lights are broken or did you signal at the last light or did you yield to that oncoming traffic and what about that pedestrian who was walking in front of you a thousand things rush through your mind when you see a cop we all go through this today today in america the former land of the free from big names to unknowns the people are harassed everyone is harassed by an intrusive government because we don't pray for it properly. We don't pray that they stay out of our way. So what do they do? They get in our way. Just the other day, no one, no one is immune from this. Did you hear about that guy who stars on the TV show Iron Chef? I've never seen that show, but I, I know who it, is, who, who it is or when it was on. You've probably seen the show. And man, they make fantastic looking things on Iron Chef. But the cops pulled over the Iron Chef star, pulled him right out of the middle of traffic. And in the middle of Los Angeles, pulled him right over in the middle of traffic and dragged him away to throw him into their interrogation room. And we're still getting all the details from the news. Uh, about the arrest of this Iron Chef show's star, but the reports say they got him into interrogation and they grilled him for more than 30 minutes at 350 degrees. But back to how badly you react when you see a policeman. It's so understandable. I mean, when you're driving down any street in America today and you see a police car, and this is a police officer who's charged with tracking down the bad guys and taking them in, not you. Yet the mere fact that he pulled up next to you or behind you, probably without even looking your way, that mere fact immediately causes you to focus all attention on him because the reality truly is that he is your number one threat right then. In your life, he is your number one threat. And it's not that the police are completely guiltless here. They're simply money collectors these days for the government. I mean, they choose that job. They don't have to do what they do. I mean, ask one of them why they do what they do, and ask, ask one of them who hands out a bunch of tickets all the time. Ask the lead ticket giver in your town why they do what they do, and they'll, they'll answer, oh, it's, it's for safety. Oh, oh, really? I've done this before, by the way, <laughs> with our sheriff. He didn't, he didn't like my questioning, it, it turns out, at the end. I said, so where do you find the most traffic violators? And he said, well... Most tickets are given on those long straightaways, you know, down the highway. People in cars that can, they can easily go 90 miles an hour on roads that can handle 150 mile an hour traffic, and they get bored, and they just want to get off the road, and that's where all the tickets are. But if you ask that same cop where the most traffic accidents happen, you get a very different story. It's never where they're all piled up to make the most money in tickets. They are lying 
or they're ignorant when they say they write tickets for people's safety. They're money collectors for the government. That is what they are in general. I, I, here I go. I have a lot of cops who I'm friends with. I, I love the, the local sheriff. He's been to our home before. We've gone out to dinner with him before. But when the government profits from crime, they get, the government gets more crime because they encourage it. And, and people who would normally be innocent commit crimes because it just happens. I'm not saying we, we can't commit a crime because we're not capable of it or because we're not, quote, good people. It's because there are so many hundreds of thousands of laws. It can always use, be used against us. Again, they are money collectors for the government. And when the government profits from crime, they get more of it because they encourage it. Now, if the government wanted to stop you from speeding, the first time you got stopped for speeding, they would give you a $200,000 fine and revoke your driver's license. You'd never be able to drive again. Now, that would stop speeders. But they know that most people can't afford a $200,000 fine, and they want you to keep on paying them. So what they do is they, they manage, they try to find out what they can charge you, the very maximum amount they can charge most people and still get paid and still get repeat offenders. So they charge you $250, $350 for speeding down a long highway. And that way you can, you can pay it and it's not going to be fun and you're going to have a hard time, but they don't care because you're paying, you're, you're, you're giving them more and more money, and then they let you keep your license with, you know, with the first several offenses, if not a whole bunch of offenses, unless they send you to traffic school after a while, in which case they get a big cut from that too. But they know that they can charge you a lot of money, but they know exactly the max they can charge most people to get paid, and yet still get repeat offenders. They don't care about safety. We've proved that. I proved that a few minutes ago, and if you disagree with that, you really have a problem explaining away what I described. They are there to collect money. Now, let me say I'm all for safety. I'm all for street monitoring. I believe the government has the right and they have the duty to manage traffic and make rules that government that govern its flow. I mean, unlike godless libertarians, excuse me for being redundant, Unlike libertarians, I know the government has the right and responsibility to do certain things, including this. The fact that they do it badly, though, that's no reason to, to deny them from that authority. The fact they do it badly is why we should demand that they do it right. Cops should not be money collectors for the government. They should be out there truly stopping the bad guys. They should be truly stopping people who are unsafe. So the big problem with traffic enforcement is that the rules are obviously corrupt and they're geared toward making money for the government and not in stopping safety hazards. Cops aren't any more innocent than school teachers are. The government schools destroy children. Teachers are not innocent in that. Don't fall for that lie. They don't have to be a part of that system, and yet they are. The money's too good for them. So the frontline workers who work these jobs, they actually get more flack from those of us who understand the nature of selfish government wickedness than those above them. The cops get more flack from me than their, than their duty officers that assign them these jobs because those cops are the ones that say, yes, I will do this. Now, if all of our leaders were saved, some, some of that frustration might go away. But then again, there sure are a lot of church leaders today who are really messed up, especially the national ones, the ones, the godly men who really make it big. It seems like they really fall big. I mean, is that really where we should be spending our prayer efforts? Or perhaps we should pray for the government exactly the way God says and pray that they leave us alone. If we Christians prayed that in mass, okay, if we Christians prayed regularly that the government leaves us along and we prayed that in mass that's um in mass that's mexican or ukrainian or maybe french it means a lot don't you think if we did that the innocent in our nations would have more fear of our own government or do you think the innocent people you and i would have less fear of the government we'd have a lot less a father innocently driving his family around town wouldn't go berserk with worry over what he may or may not have done the minutes preceding seeing the cop. 
most of us would rather give CPR to Rosie O'Donnell than see a policeman pull up behind us. It's a bad government, getting into things they have no business and it causes our reactions. Now we are selfish beings. That's the way God made us to be. It's a protective mechanism in us. Now it can run away from us and we, we may not control it like, as we should. And that's a sin. That's a problem. But we're selfish beings by nature. That's protective for us. It, God instilled that into us to a degree so that we protect ourselves from harm and we protect our loved ones. And let's face it, our selfish selves care far more that our families and ourselves lead peaceable lives than, than if our government leaders find salvation. You've got to tell me you're telling me the truth. I mean, you're, you're not. You're lying if you say you care more for your president's salvation than for the, that your family's left alone. That would be a lie in most cases, unless you're a liberal. If you take the Bible literally, it sure seems that God wants us to, to care for our families that they're left alone more than our leader's salvation also. I mean, think about what the nation and even the world would be like if we had strong families that didn't fear the government. And if we had criminals who did fear the government. I mean, most churches these days, they don't talk about this stuff. They're, the places where the lukewarm believers go, I mean, they're not even churches. They're just buildings with letter T's on top of them. But our real churches, they would be far more effective. And if you think I don't care about the, the president's salvation... Listen, Christianity would see a surge. More and more families would stay intact if the government weren't allowed to be people's, quote, savior. If governments were limited in their power to interfere with innocent citizens. And may I make a prediction? I bet in a few years, far more leaders would be Christians than will ever take place if we wrongly pray for their salvation more than we pray for anyone else's. All sorts of advantages result in praying God's prayer for our government leaders to leave us alone. Now, the fact that God tells us to do this, that's plenty of reason enough to do it. But as usual, God's ways are always best for us, too. His ways are obviously better than our ways. And our problem is simply that we don't know as a group what His ways are. We just don't know. We don't want to read the clear words He inspired us to read. So let's get back and reread those four verses now that we started in the last podcast. And I sure hope you read, you listened to podcast number three before you, you started this. If you didn't, now be honest with us. We will wait for you to go do it right now, but come right back. It's going to sound so good to you to hear 1 Timothy 2 now, those, those four verses, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. Now that you understand it, and I'm going to emphasize a little bit, now that you understand it, what it's telling us, it's going to sound so marvelous. And here it goes. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. <laughs> your challenge. Get the prayer chains going. Teach your family first, and then your friends, and then all in your church to pray that the government leaves us alone. If we don't start doing this, we'll keep getting bad law, such as gun control laws. And you know that a three-day waiting period before a liberal is allowed to say something would save far more lives than the same restriction on gun buyers, right? But we should expect the law to get only worse given our bad prayers. Remember, for 4,000 years, mankind has had virtually no godly leaders. Man's been on the planet for 6,000 to 10,000 years, no more than that for sure. But for 4,000 years especially, Mankind's had virtually no godly kings and leaders. So you can pray for a godly government. A lot of people probably have before you, especially before the current generations, before modern time. Back in biblical days, people would pray for their leaders more than now. Hopefully they prayed the right thing, but they didn't have Paul's words yet, most of them. But for 4,000 years, mankind's had virtually no godly leaders. 
So you can pray for a godly government, but God doesn't tell you to do that, and God isn't stupid. He wants you to pray something that allows you to do the work that he has in store for you. He wants you to worry about you, not worrying about your leaders. In praying exclusively that leaders get saved and do the right thing, you're sort of passing the buck. Oh, if only they get saved, and if only the Supreme Court had godly members, then, oh, our nation would be righteous and we wouldn't have to work as hard. No, do what God says. Don't pray for your president's salvation more often than you pray for the waitress at your local diner, and instead, leverage your prayer. Make your prayers far more powerful and effective by doing it His way. Now, what are the odds we'll have a godly government? God is so smart. I mean, he knows how much more can be done if what he says to do is our primary prayer. So be thankful he's making it so easy on us. As a parent, as our parent, God wants us to make things. God wants to make things simple and easy for us, his children. So tonight, you and your family pray that our nation's leaders leave us alone. Teach your churches to begin praying this way. Pray that you begin to see the good that comes of these prayers as more and more government interference gets less and less in our lives. So as we wrap up, I want to thank Dexter. He's my sound guy. We want you to keep in mind that someday we'll be going on eternity leave, and when I do, you're not going to have me to kick around anymore, Buster. But you'll be going on eternity leave as well, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But until you do... You have full control of the thermostat when you arrive. You can either order excruciatingly hot or perfect. Where you spend your eternity leave is your choice. I can quote Putty when he said, well, I'm not the one going to hell. But even so, I'd love to see you elsewhere. And let me remind you again, stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell. You've just been attacked with a force field of truth. Remember, if you're ever unsatisfied with anything we say, you may mail back the unused portion and will gladly say identical or similar material at no additional charge in the future. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing. <laughs>